Thank you, Jeff. What a beautiful song based on the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, speaking so clearly about the greatness of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Messiah, the Savior of all the world. And now, having heard that testimony from the last book of the New Testament, we go to the first book of the New Testament, the gospel called Matthew, and we will see one of the great aha moments of scripture in our text for today. Follow along, please, on the screens as I read for you. Matthew chapter 16. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. And suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. One of the positives of COVID-19 has been the various fun challenges people have come up with all around the world. There are people posting their senior picture from high school in support of the class of 2020. Another challenge has people recreating famous works of art using whatever they had around the house, stuff that we find now in our thrift store. One of my favorite challenges has been the first photo challenge, where couples post the first or an early photo of themselves. And as the Word of God encouraged us through Pastor Allen last week, I thought as we ease into reopening that we could have a mirthful moment together and try the first photo challenge with our pastors. So here we go. All right, so that first one's pretty, pretty easy. That's me and my wife, Christina. And that is Pastor Stephen Grant and his wife, Nanette. Pastor Allen and his wife, Connie. Now this is where it really gets fun. That is Pastor June and Dr. Al Barrow. Pastor Doug Pratt and his lovely wife Jeannie. And Pastor Doug's awesome mustache. And last but certainly not least, Pastor Bat Brad Rogers and his wife Lauren. I'm trying to get my hair to where Pastor Brad's is, but it's, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as awesome as that. Now as fun and funny as those photos are, they also have a spiritual implication and tie into today's text. You see, these couples have come to really know each other since those pictures. And we, similarly, can know our God. And before we dive into today's text about knowing God, we have to acknowledge a very important fact. 
that God is God and we are not. Whatever we know about God is what God has ultimately revealed of himself. In verse 17, Jesus says to Peter that flesh and blood did not reveal this to Peter, but God the Father has. What we know about God is revealed by him. And this is actually true of nearly all of our natural relationships. When you meet someone and you grow your friendship, you get to know them based on what they choose to reveal about themselves. Maybe for a more famous or prominent person, we might read up on them on the internet or we might read their biography or autobiography. But even that is largely based on what they have chosen to reveal to society at large. In the same way, what we know about God is what he has revealed about himself. And ultimately, our coming to know God is not a result of our efforts, how smart we are, how diligent we are, but it's ultimately by God's grace. Now that we have humbly acknowledged God's gracious role in our knowledge of him, what does today's text tell us about knowing God? How does God reveal himself? When God reveals himself, we may not be where we expect. Jesus has led his disciples to the region of Caesarea Philippi. One of Herod the Great's sons, Philip, rebuilt the city and named it Caesarea in honor of Caesar and added Philippi, obviously, in honor of himself. It was about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. So that would be like going from here to Sarasota. So it wasn't close. And this was also a place where the Greek god Pan and Caesar were worshipped, not the living God. Why would God the Father reveal such an aha about who Jesus is way out in Caesarea Philippi? Not in Jerusalem where people are waiting for the Savior, but way out there, somewhere the disciples did not expect. The entire world finds itself someplace we did not expect. Some of you expected to be up north by now, but have had to stay here for safety and other considerations. Many of the students have had to stay home for the last two months. No one expected that. Many of you had travel plans for the summer of this year, and nearly all of those have either been canceled or delayed. Or how many of us made goals when this year started? We're likely nowhere near where we expected to be by June in relation to those goals. Or how many of us made New Year's resolutions? Maybe to lose weight or go to the gym more regularly. Well, I guess another positive of COVID-19 is that this year is the first time we all have a legitimate excuse for why we broke our New Year's resolution of going to the gym regularly. <laughs> but we all find ourselves someplace we did not expect. And we don't like to be led to unexpected places. But Jesus often leads us to unexpected places, often difficult and tough places, to reveal himself in a powerful way, in ways that maybe he couldn't have revealed himself if we were where we expected to be. Think about some of your closest friends. Those who you count closest to you. They became close, most likely, when you went to unexpected places. When life led you to tough or difficult places to places you didn't expect to go and you certainly did not want to go. When you faced financial hardship, when you faced heartbreak or tragedy or trauma, when you faced sickness or terminal disease, those moments, those difficult moments, revealed who our fair weather friends were and revealed our true friends. Those unexpected places, unexpected moments is when the character of our friends was truly revealed. In the same way, 
Our God leads us to unexpected places to reveal himself because our God is not a fair weather friend. Our God is a forever friend. So some of you might find yourselves today in an unexpected place, in a difficult place, praying for something that maybe you didn't expect to be praying for even yesterday. But God desires to reveal himself to you. When God reveals himself, we may not be where we expect. So when God reveals himself, we may not be where we expect. What else does today's text tell us about knowing God? What is the result or consequence of God revealing himself? When God reveals himself, a personal response is required. Jesus asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they give a variety of responses. Up to this point in Matthew's gospel, Jesus has healed, he's cast out demons, he's calmed storms, he's fed multitudes, he's walked on water. And despite all of these signs, no one is correct on who Jesus is. In fact, in verse 1 earlier, the Pharisees and Sadducees were told, came to Jesus demanding a sign, testing him for a sign from heaven. Despite all those signs, they wanted another sign. Another sign from the Savior. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do you say I am? These disciples have been living with him. They've learned from his teaching. They've witnessed his miracles. They've walked with him. One of them walked on water with him. But a personal response was required. What is your personal response to Jesus? Who do you say Jesus is? Has this pandemic caused you to question who he is? Is he no longer your good shepherd? Is he no longer the bread of life? Who do you say Jesus is? And it's not enough if you know about Jesus. It's not enough if your parents know about Jesus. It's not enough if your spouse knows about Jesus. It's not enough if your friends know Jesus. And it's certainly not enough if you go to a church that preaches and teaches Jesus. Who do you say Jesus is? And this is the most important question any of us will ever be asked. Because abundant life in this life and eternal life in the life to come is at stake. Romans 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Your personal response to what Jesus has done and his lordship is important. And this personal response is something that we often have to renew, something that we have to remember. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, a day where we honor, we mourn, and we remember those who died while serving in the United States Armed Forces. And we have to remember because it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget that our freedom came at great sacrifice. We have to have a day tomorrow to remember, not just to have a cookout and go to the beach, but to remember the ultimate sacrifice that men and women over the decades have made for us. In the same way, it's easy to forget that our God has purchased our freedom through great personal sacrifice. We have to renew often who Jesus is. Because in moments like this, we might be tempted to question God's goodness. With a pandemic drawing out as it has, we might have been tempted to question his sovereignty or his power, his wisdom, his love. Or maybe some of us, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, have come to Jesus saying, Jesus, show me another sign that you are the Christ, that you are my Messiah. But as a song we sang earlier says, does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. 
And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. When God reveals himself, a personal response is required. So when God reveals himself, a personal response is required, but what else does this text tell us about God revealing himself? What might be a benefit? When God reveals himself, we properly understand who we are. Peter makes a marvelous confession by the grace of God about who Jesus is. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But Jesus also makes a marvelous confession about Peter. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When Peter properly understood who Jesus was, he properly understood who he was. He was given identity. He was given purpose. He would be the foundational leader of the church. And Jesus said that I will build my church, my church. And here we are today. The gates of hell have not prevailed against it, and the gates of hell surely won't prevail against it because our God is building it. I asked, who do you say Jesus is? But who does Jesus say you are? How is he speaking identity to you in these difficult and turbulent times? How is he desiring to reveal himself to you? He loves you. He gave his only son for you. He poured out his Holy Spirit on you that you might be enabled and empowered to live for him. He desires to reveal himself to you and he also desires to reveal who you are. When God reveals himself, we properly understand who we are. So when God reveals himself, we may not be where we expect. A personal response is required and we properly understand who we are. And finally, what does this text tell us about knowing God? What else might we glean from it? When God reveals himself, we do not have the full picture. Peter went from getting the answer right in verse 16 to getting the answer so very wrong in verse 23. He went from being called blessed to being called Satan. Wow. I don't know if you've ever had that in one of your classes, but he went from an A student to failing. He flunked. Because he didn't have the full picture. Even though God the Father revealed that Jesus is the Savior, he didn't have the full picture. Peter didn't have the full picture that the Messiah, the Savior, would not merely win a victory over Rome, but that he would defeat sin and death. Peter didn't have the full picture that Jesus would not merely win a military victory, but an eternal victory. He did not have the full picture that this victory would come through seeming defeat. He couldn't accept it. Jesus would talk about him suffering and dying and rising again on the third day. He, that was out of his realm of what the Savior was going to do. See, a dead Savior is an oxymoron. Like jumbo shrimp or pretty ugly or civil war. Two words that just don't make sense together. He didn't have the full picture. Because as the Bible says in Isaiah 55, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways above our ways, his thoughts above our thoughts. But the beautiful thing is, Jesus would continue to reveal himself to Peter. He would continue to teach him. He would continue to walk with him. He would continue to love him. Even when Peter failed, even when Peter rejected him, Jesus continued to reveal himself to Peter. None of us, brothers and sisters, has the full picture. But one day, one day we will. 
one day we're going to stand before him. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and you will have the full picture. What will it look like? When you open your eyes for the first time, what would it look like? What would it smell like? What is it going to sound like? The last few months, our church has said goodbye to some dear members who've gone home to be with the Lord. Members who've been pillars and foundations of the church. The wider body of Christ this week lost Ravi Zacharias, a noted apologist and Christian thinker. Can you imagine when they heard those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter your master's joy. Wow. What is it going to sound like? What is it going to be like, brothers and sisters, for us when we don't need faith anymore? Because faith becomes sight. What is it going to be like when we don't have to ask questions like, is he worthy? Is water wet? Is Florida humid? Yes! A resounding yes. Is he worthy? Of course he's worthy. Jesus is the most beautiful, more beautiful than any sunset, any double rainbow that you've ever seen. When Jesus, when God reveals himself, we don't have the full picture. Let's look at those pictures again. You probably barely recognize some of those people in those photos. And in fact, if I were to ask them, they might say, I barely recognize those individuals pictured. Because since those early moments, they've really come to know one another. They've grown as individuals and as a couple. Many of them have walked through unexpected places in life together. Many have walked through the valley of the shadow of death hand in hand, where they truly revealed their love for one another. There may have been times where they've had to personally decide to once again recommit themselves to their love for one another. The love that their spouse showed them allowed them to properly understand who they were and their identity in Christ and their purpose in Christ. And even though in these smiling pictures they did not have the full picture of who their spouse was, they would get to know each other over the years and reveal themselves and love, them, love each other all the more. All because they have covenanted with one another. And brothers and sisters, that is our beautiful reality. I want you to think through if you and God, if you and Jesus had a first photo, when would that be? Where are you? Maybe for some of you, you're in your bedroom as a kid and you're with your mom or dad and they're praying for you to receive the Lord. Maybe for some of you, you're at a retreat in middle school or high school or in college group. Maybe for some of you, you're on a mission trip. You're not even in this country. You're somewhere else entirely when you have your first photo of you and Jesus. Maybe for some of you, your first photo is at the great banquet when you fell in love again with Jesus and recommitted yourself to him. Or maybe your first photo was this week when this pandemic has led you to the foot of the cross. Wherever you are, whenever that first photo is, hasn't God revealed himself as a God who's faithful? And will he not continue to be faithful to you? Because our God is a God who covenanted with us. Like these couples promised one another, our God has promised us. He said at the Last Supper to his disciples, this cup is the cup of the new covenant poured out as a sacrifice for you. Our God will never leave us or forsake us. Our God will continue to reveal himself to us. Our God has been revealing himself. But have we been listening? Have we been attentive? Have we been understanding? Maybe this week, instead of consuming so much news and glued to the news, maybe we could focus on the good news. Maybe we could take time to read scripture. 
Or as Pastor Allen preached last week from Acts chapter 12, maybe we can laugh together. Or perhaps like the Pharisees and Sadducees, if you've been tempted to ask God for another sign, maybe you could take some time to reflect on all the moments in your life where God has led you powerfully and lovingly. Perhaps like one of our church's favorite psalms, Psalms 4610, you can be still and know that he is God. It's hard to be still now, isn't it? We're all getting a little stir crazy, but the Bible tells us to be still and know your God. Perhaps this week, when we wake up, we could take a moment to thank God for our health, thank God for his provisions, maybe say a prayer for our great country, our president, our leaders, before we reach for our phone. Maybe through Zoom or letter, a phone call, a text, or an email, we can ask one another, what has God been revealing to you? How has he been revealing himself through this pandemic? Isn't it comforting, strengthening, and encouraging to love and serve a God who reveals himself? Because for the follower of Christ, it is not a question of if God reveals himself, but when God reveals himself. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are a God who reveals yourself. Throughout our lives and even now, Lord, you have proven yourself to be a faithful God, a loving God, a God of covenant. So Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who find themselves in an unexpected place, a tough and a difficult place. Would you reveal yourself to them now? Would you reveal yourself as the faithful God, as the loving God? Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Are you worthy? You are, almighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Is he worthy? Is he worthy? 